you for who you are. We thank you that you're good. We thank you that you're mighty. We thank you that you're great. We thank you that you're a miracle working God. We thank you that you're working in our lives right now as we praise and we worship you. We thank you that you're inhabiting that praise this morning. Glory to God. Come on, somebody shout. We will dance, we will dance for your glory.
Say it with a smile on your face. God is good. Say, God loves me. Point to yourself. Say, God loves me. Kind of say it with a little smirk on your face. Like, God loves me. Yeah. <laughs> Glory to God. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Faithful God, faithful Father, you're so good to us. You're so good to us. We trust you in your leading. We trust you in your leading. You're leading us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Glory to God. We trust you in your leading. You're directing. We bless you, Lord. I decree and declare that this body of believers, that we have faith to step out in what you're calling us to do. We're obedient to you. Just right now, just in your own way, in your own words, just offer your body as a living sacrifice. Just make that commitment to say, God, whatever you want, I'm gonna do it. No matter how big or how crazy it sounds, I'm gonna do it. Bless you, Lord. Activate that faith this morning. Hallelujah. You've never left me. You've never left me alone. For you are true. And you are.
choose to trust you in your leading. We choose to trust you in your leading, in your guiding us, in your instructing us. We choose to trust you. You're worthy of our trust. You're worthy of our trust, our obedience. Oh, we choose to step out on the waters. <laughs> I see you standing out beyond the shore. and fall. You show up every time. Sing that again. You've never failed. You've never failed. You've never failed. Just you, just voices. You've never failed. You've never failed. And you never will. Oh, sing it one more time. You've never failed. You've never failed. You've never failed. And you never will. Glory to God. Glory to God.
Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Come on, shout unto the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Look at somebody and tell them, Jesus changes everything. Tell somebody else, Jesus changes everything. Now, now tell them this. Don't worry, be happy. And give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Jesus changes everything. How many of you found that to be true? Well, lift both hands and just praise Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We're living memorials to your faithfulness. Living testimonies to your faithfulness. You've never failed. Not one word you've ever spoken has ever failed. Not one promise has ever failed. We give you praise that you're a God that is faithful, reliable, dependable. We rejoice in your faithfulness. Thank you, Father. Lord, I thank you today that you'll be faithful to enable me to deliver this word accurately, boldly, with the anointing. Hallelujah. And as the anointing flows in this place, it removes every yoke of bondage, sets every captive free. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise for it. Amen. One more shout unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Welcome, everybody. I'm privileged to share the word with you again this week. Two weeks in a row. What a miracle that is. Hallelujah. Amen. Any of you uh, that are from out of town visiting us this week? All right, great. Thank you for being here. Praise God. Appreciate you coming. Do you have your Bibles with you today? Let's go to Romans chapter 5 once again. Romans chapter 5. I began talking to you last week about reigning in life. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. For if one man's offense, or by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. The Amplified says, reign as kings. Look at your neighbor once again and say, how does it feel sitting next to a king? <laughs> Glory to God. The word reign, as I mentioned last week, means to possess sovereign power. It also implies having royal authority. That's probably why the Amplified says reign as kings. When we're talking about royalty, we're talking about sovereign power, we're, it, it comes to mind kings and the way that they live and they exercise sovereign power, royal authority. The contemporary English Bible says live and rule as kings. Yeah. Rule as kings, praise God. If we are truly reigning as kings, then it sounds like to me that Satan has absolutely no authority over us whatsoever. I'll say it again. If we're truly reigning as kings through the righteousness that has been bought and shed, uh, bought and paid for through his shed blood, then Satan has absolutely no authority over us whatsoever. None. None. Any authority he's exercising over you, you allowed him to do it. That's right. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Come on. If you're in bondage, you've allowed him to put you there. Right. Amen. On, amen. You are the one with authority. You're the one with the power. You're the one with the dominion. Yes, sir. Amen. You have to learn to exercise it. The New Living Translation says we are to live in triumph over sin and death. No wonder Paul says in Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Tell somebody these words. Satan can't make me do anything that I don't want to do. 
I have royal authority over him. Now that, that comes as a great revelation to most people. Satan can't make you do anything you don't want to do. Somebody said, well, I committed adultery, but I didn't really want to do it. Yes, you did. Well, I slipped and drank a fifth of whiskey last week. I didn't really want to do it. Yes, you did. I cheated on my wife. I didn't want to do it. Yes, you did. <laughs> Satan can't make you do anything you don't want to do. Good, the Bible man. says in the book of James, a man is drawn away and tempted of his own lust. That's right. You had the thought in your mind, just waiting for the opportunity to fulfill it. You didn't quite in this church. <laughs> Sin shall have no dominion over you. So Satan can't make you do anything <clears throat> that you don't want to do. You have royal authority over him. The New Living Translation says, sin is no longer your master. Sin is no longer your master. Well, if that's true, and it is, then why don't you take authority over whatever sin you might have in your life right now? Amen. Amen. Well, if you're too embarrassed, do it when you get home. <laughs> but don't, don't go another day without taking authority over it. Yes. You have authority over it. Yes. Paul makes it very clear <clears throat> that we've been made free by the blood of Jesus. Right. However, he also says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. I'm already free. I've been made free by the blood of Jesus. That took place 2,000 years ago. But I'm the one who has to enforce it. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Standing fast is our responsibility. Notice the understood subject of the sentence is you stand fast. And also, notice once again that it says, goes on to say, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So even though you've been made free, and that freedom took place 2,000 years ago, you can get entangled again with bondage. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 You would have to allow it. Can you say amen? amen. Is this too deep? No. 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 Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So my responsibility is to stand fast in that freedom. Jesus has already done his part. Now it's up to us to do our part. He bought and paid for our freedom, and now we must enforce it. Look at it this way. You're already free. Now it's your responsibility to maintain that freedom, to protect that freedom. Amen. That's why he went on to say, once again, and be not entangled with the yoke of bondage, implying that it is possible to become entangled in bondage again, even after you've been made free. Amen. You know, I've heard testimonies many times of people that got delivered of smoking. And, you know, they went quite some time of not smoking. And then, you know, they wound up yielding to that temptation and began smoking again. And it became even harder to get free of it the next time. People that, you know, drink. And they got delivered. And, you know, they slipped, wind up drinking. And, uh, you know, and it got harder to break that habit again. But notice, you have to allow it. Amen. Amen. You have to allow it. You have to yield to it. You don't have to, but you're the one who yields to it. You have two choices, yield or take authority over it. Amen. Yield or take authority over it. Can you say amen? This really is a good sermon, praise God. Now, 
it's possible to become entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Let me ask you this. Who is he writing to? The world? Christians. He's writing to Christians. Come on. Amen. <gasps> Brother Jerry, a Christian can be entangled again with a yoke of bondage? <laughs> Apparently so. Come on. He's writing to Christians. Amen. 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 All through this letter, he, he, he refers to the people he's writing to, brethren. Brethren, you, that, that means you're part of the body of Christ. Right. You're a child of God. Yep. And so he is saying that it is possible for believers to get entangled again with the yoke of bondage. But they don't have to. Right. They can stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set them free. Yes. How? By exercising their authority over it. Yeah. Now, the... New Living Translation says, now make sure that you stay free. Make sure that you stay free. <clears throat> Amen. As I said last week, you know, when I got delivered to smoking, I really didn't want to be delivered that night. You know, I mean, God sent the evangelist down the, down the aisle and he pointed me out and said, uh, you're going to get free of smoking tonight. Well, I didn't come there to get free of smoking. I didn't really want to get free of smoking. Carolyn wanted me free, but I didn't want free. And, and when he called me out and he prayed over me and, and had me to confess, I didn't know the power of words back then, but had me to confess that I'll never smoke again. And then, you know, I, I went to my car and that pack of Winston's is laying on the dash. Carolyn wouldn't let me bring them in the church. And I saw that pack of cigarettes, and I went to grab it. And, of course, I didn't know any better, but I thought, if I put one of them things in my mouth, God will strike me dead. Because <laughs> I stood up in front of all them people and said, I'll never smoke again. And the next day when I went to the shop, that was the hardest day of my life. I mean, you know, the top left-hand drawer of my snap-on tool chest kept my cigarettes and my cigars. I didn't think you could work on a car without a cigarette hanging out of your mouth. That's the way my daddy did it, you know. Come on. And that's the way I did it. And I told you last week how that this guy that, that had worked for my dad and now he's working with me, he never had cigarettes. From as long as I remember, he always borrowed cigarettes from my daddy. I always told him, I'll pay you back. And then he started borrowing them from me when I started smoking. He always said, and I'll pay you back. This went on for years. I remember him saying that when I was a little boy to my daddy. Now I'm grown, you know, and, and he's borrowing cigarettes from me. That day, the night after I got delivered to smoking, that day, he brought a box this big <laughs> with cartons of cigarettes and said, uh, Bubba, I've come to pay you back. Here's all the cigarettes I bummed off you all, this, all these years, and your daddy too. I said, Ariel, where'd you get to? He said, you don't want to know. <laughs> I thought, isn't that, well, I didn't know back then. I didn't know it was the devil, yeah. you know. Come on. I mean, the devil was setting me up. I got delivered the night before. And there that carton of cigarettes or that box full of cartons of cigarettes is sitting by my tool chest. And every time I'd get up from, you know, doing something on that cart, walk over my tool chest, get another tool, and uh, I'd see those cigarettes. And every once in a while I'd reach for that top drawer and I'd shut it. And I thought, I thought God will strike me and everybody in this, in this building dead if I put one of them things in my mouth. I got so desperate before the day was up, lighting a torch looked good. <laughs> if I could have figured out a way to light that screwdriver up, I'd have smoked the end of it. You know? But I, got, I made it through the day. Now, I really wasn't serving the Lord. I wasn't sold out to God at that time. But I made it through the day. Now, I could have yielded. Several times I could have yielded. But I didn't. And if I didn't, then Satan had no authority over me. And I made it through that day 
And I got up the next morning and the desire was gone. The temptation of it was gone. And that was a long, long time ago, over 48 years ago. Praise God. And that's never been a temptation. I don't, I don't, you know, uh, when I'm believing God for, you know, the next million dollars we need before Friday, I don't get tempted to go smoke a cigarette when I'm under pressure. Or, or drink, you know, a fifth of this or that. I didn't like that when I did it anyway. I just did it because my buddies did it. I'm glad I got free of that. Amen. Amen. But I, that's not a temptation. The devil never comes to me when I'm under pressure, you know, believing for financial breakthroughs. Uh, Jerry, won't you just smoke? That is not even a temptation. He knows better than to bring that to me. Won't you drink? That's not even a temptation. What would be your greatest temptation if smoking and drinking is not? Worry. Now, we don't talk about worry being a sin. Hello? Didn't Jesus say, give no thought to what you'll wear, what you'll eat, what you'll, you know, put on and so forth? Didn't he say, give no thought? Didn't Paul said, worry not? The Amplified it says, worry not. How come worry is acceptable with most believers, but drinking is not? Don't you dare yield to that temptation to drink. And the person that's saying it's probably the biggest worry wart in their house, as we used to say. If you don't respond better, I'm going someplace else to preach. <laughs> Worry is just as big a sin as drinking and smoking. Yeah. Running around and all that other stuff we consider sin. But, but for Christians, it's acceptable. Well, everybody's got to worry. No, they don't. No, they don't. Amen. Amen. Make sure, the New Living Translation says, make sure that you stay free. Now, verses 16 and 17 give us one of the ways that we can make sure we stay free. The New Living Translation says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what a sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil which is just the opposite of what the Holy Spirit wants. So notice what he's saying. Follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You'll never be led astray. Listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not going to tempt you into doing something that is wrong. He's not even going to suggest it. He's the one that would say, don't. Amen. Remember those little cartoons, you know, that used to come on and they got this devil on one shoulder no. oh, yeah. and this, this good guy on the other shoulder, you know, and the devil's whispering in this guy's ear and the little angel's whispering in his other ear and he's either yielding one to the other. That's right. Amen? Amen? That's what it's, Paul is referring to about casting down yes. every imagination, every thought that does not line up with the Word of God. Bring it into the obedience of Christ. Right. Can you say amen? amen. So, one of the ways that we stay free, maintain our freedom, is to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Don't shut him out. Listen to him. Amen. Amen. He, he, he always gives you a way out of this. Amen. And the beautiful thing is, he will not condemn you. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ. To walk after the spirit, not of the flesh. Amen. He's not going to condemn you. He's not going to say things like, if you do this, God will strike you dead. No, in fact, if you really want to do it and you're determined to do it, he'll stand by and watch you, allow you to do it. But the Bible also says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. That would be grieving to him when he's trying to protect you. When he's trying to keep you... Uh, whole and free, praise God. Amen. So, you know, every, every opportunity to sin, there's also an opportunity 
to hear the Holy Spirit. Amen. And if you, if you just stop and think about it, every time you yielded to sin, there was another voice, which was the Holy Spirit's voice, telling you, don't. Yield to me, not Satan. Yield to me, not sin. Yield to me, the Holy Spirit would say, and not to the temptation. So this is one of the ways we stay free. The King James says that if you do this, then you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So once again, who's in charge here, the devil or you? It's not a trick question. <laughs> who's in charge here, the devil or you? Me. You, praise God. Amen. Satan's not in control of your life. You're the one who determines your own destiny, praise God, based on what you do with the Word of God. You're the one with sovereign power. You're the one with royal authority. Isn't that true? The question is, are you using it? The question is not, do you have it? The question is, are you using it? Can you say amen? You know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, uh, we guys go biking every once in a while on a, on a meeting, you know, church-like group that's here in the church, particularly if it's within 200 miles of Fort Worth. That's a motorcycle ride. And so we go quite often, you know, and, and uh, usually, uh, you know, one of the reasons we ride is, is to eat. And <laughs> that's what Stuart thinks. And so... Uh, one of, we, we always stop at a, you know, a familiar place that we like and so forth, and we eat. Now, I know, I know Stuart did not leave the house without some money in his pocket. Yeah. <laughs> and I know Tony don't leave the house without money in his pocket. Yeah. So it's not a question of do they have some money in their pocket. The question is, will they use it? (laughs) Now, Stuart always offers to buy breakfast everywhere we stay. Every hotel we stay in, he offers, boys, I got breakfast in the morning. But he knows it's free. But one day we got him. (laughs) Boys, I got breakfast in the morning and it wasn't free. (laughs) Cost him about 100, 200 bucks or something to feed all of us. And we laughed and just had a a blast over that. But Tony, Tony says, I got the check and uh, we give it to him and then he holds it up for somebody else to take it. (laughs) I, I got the check. I got it. It's not a question of whether they got the money. Well, they use it. It's not a question of whether you have the authority. Are you using it? You don't just go around the devil and say, I got authority. You got to use it. Can you say amen? Tony said that's right. Praise God. We're hard on on each other. Praise God. But we love each other. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So it's not a matter of whether or not we have the authority. We do. The Bible is very clear about that. Make no mistake. You are the one with the authority. You're the one with the dominion. You're the one with the sovereign power. Royal authority. You're to reign as a king in life. But are you exercising that power? Are you exercising that authority? That authority? Can you say amen? amen? Quit asking God to set you free. He's already done that. John eight thirty six says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Well, did he do it? 
Did Calvary work? Did His blood work? Did His death and resurrection work? Then you're free. The Son has made you free and you're free indeed. However, you can let go of that freedom and wind up back in bondage. So it's not a question of whether or not God has set you free. He's already done that. The Son has set you free. So then why would you ask Him to do something that He's already done? What you really need is a revelation of your authority. That was one of the major prayers that the Apostle Paul prayed for the body of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know. That you may know something. That the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened that you may come to this knowledge The Amplified says, the eyes of your heart be flooded with light. That was his prayer for the body of Christ. That the eyes of your heart be flooded with light. Verse 19, the Amplified says, so that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and limited, unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe. Have you got that up there on the Amplified? Yes, sir. And so that you can know and understand, know and understand what is the immeasurable, unlimited, and surpassing greatness of His power in and for us who believe. Look at somebody and say, I've got that on the inside of me. That's what the Bible just said. Tell them, that's what the Bible just said. I've got immeasurable, unlimited, and surpassing greatness of His power on the inside of me, praise God. That ought to get the job done, wouldn't you agree? That'll stop the devil in his tracks. But I have to exercise it. Can you say amen? Are you a believer? Say, I'm a believer. Then this power is in you right now. Not when you get to heaven, it's in you right now. The question is, are you exercising any of it? It's like uh, someone said to Brother Hagin one time, Brother Hagin, I've got all the faith in the world. He said, that's your problem. You still got it. Yeah. You're not using any of it. Come on. Good. You're not exercising any of it. Amen. You've got all the power, the authority that is necessary to keep the devil off your back. Yeah. To keep him out of your life, praise God but are you exercising it? You're not helpless, you're not powerless, and you're not limited in any way. And you're supposed to be reigning in life. Tell somebody, I'm supposed to be reigning in life. life. Now the Bible wouldn't tell us that if it wasn't possible. We are to reign in life. Hallelujah. One uh, commentary says that we are to be firm and unwavering in our stand against the adversary. Firm and unwavering in our stand against the adversary. How would you respond if a thief broke into your house and you had the means to stop him? (laughs) Blow him up. I pity the fool that would break into Kenny's house. (laughs) <laughs> huh? If a thief broke into your house and you had the means whereby to stop him or prevent him from doing what he intended to do, what would you do? Would you just welcome him in? We've been waiting for you. How long will you be with us this time? What would you like? Would you like for me to help you carry it out? That is not what you do, not if you're smart. If you've got the means, you know, John Wayne says gun control is a steady aim. A man got to do what a man got to do. 
Don't come into my house, pilgrim. Come on. Amen. If I have the means and the ability to stop him, I'm going to stop him. The Bible says Satan is a thief. He comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But he comes knocking, we just let him in. How long will you be with us this time? Last time you made the whole household sick. Took everything we worked so hard for. No, the worst thief that you'll ever have to deal with is Satan. And you have authority over him. Can you say amen? You have authority over him. Why would you let him come through your house, tear up everything, break everything, steal everything, destroy your kids, destroy your life? Why would you just sit by and allow that to happen when you have dominion over him? Hallelujah. Amen. I, I, I really have a problem with a thief. I just don't like a thief. You know, uh, years ago, before we built our new home over here, <laughs> new home 30 years ago, <clears throat> we had an, an old ranch house and we added on to it and we built horse stables. We had horses and had cattle and built barns and, and uh, you know, and someone had blessed me with a beautiful handmade saddle. Oh, it's beautiful. And I had this, this horse that was given to me. I had him since he was six months old. His name was Jubilee. And uh, he was part uh, Mustang and part quarter horse. Very spirited, good looking horse. Oh, that horse was beautiful. And uh, someone had given me, made me this beautiful saddle for him. And after I'd had him broken and began riding him, you know, I didn't break him. I let somebody else break him. And uh, uh, I began riding him. Man, he was, oh, he was muscular. He was good looking, you know, and it was, it was just fun to ride him. And I rode him one day and I put my saddle in the tack room along with the other saddles. We had three other horses. And I put that saddle in the tack room. And the next morning when I got up, somebody had come and broken into my tack room and stole all the saddles. And the one that I missed the most was the one that was made for me. It was a beautiful saddle. It made me so mad. Oh, it made me mad. A thief. The reason I don't like a thief, he has no regard for what you went through to get what he just stole. He has no regard for how long you worked hard for it or how long you bleed for it. He has no regard for what you went through to get what he just carried off. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember the Lord saying, well, if you get that mad at the devil, you could stop him from stealing from you. Not only that, but make him pay back everything he's stolen. Sevenfold. I was preaching this one time, and when I got through, Jesse the planter said, you mean to tell me we can believe God for sevenfold? That's what the Bible says. You catch a thief, make him recompense sevenfold. Jesse said to me, well, then I've just gotten too expensive for the devil to mess with. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We have authority over that thief. Can you say amen? amen? So once again, one commentary says, we are to be firm, unwavering in our stand against our adversary. Since Paul already stated that sin has no dominion over us and sin is the nature of Satan, then wouldn't it be reasonable to say that he has no dominion over us? If sin is his nature and it has no dominion over us, then neither does he. Amen. First John chapter three and verse eight. For this purpose was the son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The Bible very clearly says this is why Jesus came, that he might destroy the works of the devil. He has no right to steal from us. He has no right to, to, to attack our bodies. He has no right to attack our finances. He has no right to attack our children. But if we just sit by and let him do it, he'll get away with it. And when, once he finds out he can get away with it, he just keeps coming. Can he say amen? amen? Now, Jesus said in the 16th chapter of Mark, 
Verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. And he goes on with some other things that we're qualified to do. Well, if we have the ability to cast out devils, then wouldn't you think that we'd have the, have the authority to do so first? I'll say it again. If, if he said, believers will cast out devils, well, wouldn't you just think that if we have the right to do that, he'd first of all give us the authority to carry it out. Can you say amen? Look at somebody and say, I have authority over the devil. I have authority over devils. I have authority over the thief. Can you say amen? The truth is we don't have to live in bondage any longer. Not in bondage to sin, not in bondage to sickness and disease, not in bondage to poverty, lack or want. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. I think somebody I lift their hands and thank God we don't have to live in bondage. Hallelujah. We don't have to live in any form of bondage. Many years ago, in fact, it was in uh, July of 1981, <clears throat> I was asked by Kenneth Hagin to preach in his camp meeting as one of the speakers. And I remember going into that meeting and praying about what the Lord wanted me to share. And he gave me a message. First time I'd ever preached it. And he gave the title, Man's Authority Releases God's Ability. Man's Authority Releases God's Ability. Now, I preached on that subject that entire week that I was preaching in that camp meeting. Now, the Lord said that to me as I was reading Matthew chapter 18. Go there with me, Matthew chapter 18. You're familiar with it? Look at verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he goes on to make several other powerful statements, but just look at verse 18 alone. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be loosed in heaven. So that means man's authority releases God's ability. When man releases his authority, then God releases his ability. Who has this ability? We do. I'm sorry. Who has this authority? We do. Who has the ability to make it happen? God does. But notice nothing happens until man releases his authority first. Well, if God's got all this ability, why don't he just do this? Why don't he just do that? Because he's given you the authority. Yes. Yes. Amen. You act on your authority and he will release his ability without fail. Hallelujah. Amen. We sang about it this morning. He never failed me. And he won't fail you when you're exercising that God-given authority. He will back it with his ability. Heaven. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. This is what also is recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power. After that, you, uh, after that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. You shall receive power, after which the Holy Ghost has come upon you. How many of you are filled with the Holy Ghost? Yeah. Lift your hand if you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Wave that hand. Look at it while you're waving it. Make sure it's your hand, not your neighbor's. You've been filled with the Holy Ghost. That means you also have power. Amen. Amen. You have power. Power can also be defined as dominion and authority. Amen. Who has this authority? You do. Who has the ability? God does. You exercise your authority and he will exercise his ability. You release your authority he releases his ability. Somebody give the Lord a shout, praise God. <laughs> Nothing happens until we exercise our God-given authority. So what good is sovereign power? 
What good is royal authority if you never use it? You, you know, we're, we're in some hot weather, a season of hot weather. Uh, you know, it's been over 100 a few days uh, already. And you can sit in your house and sweat like a mule. <laughs> owning an air conditioner. But if you don't turn it on, you're going to sit there and sweat. I don't know why it's so hot in this house. I do. You didn't turn the AC on. Amen. You do your part and God will do his part. You don't have to sit there and sweat all day. You can turn the AC on, praise God, and be cool. Amen. You do your part. And God will do his part. Amen. Amen. So having all this power and authority does you absolutely no good if you never exercise it. Amen. Say this with me. I release my authority. I release my God authority. releases his ability. God his ability. Tell somebody, I release my authority. I release my authority. God, releases his God releases his ability. Isn't that how Peter and John got the lame man at the gate called Beautiful Healed? Go with me to Acts chapter 3 and let's make sure. Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> excuse me. Now Peter and John went up together in the temple at the house of prayer, or the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. <clears throat> See, I'm having to exercise my authority right now. Yeah. That's right. That's good. See, when they, when they ran that breathing apparatus down my throat, they scarred my vocal cords. And every time I get up to preach, I have to exercise my God-given authority. Because right. in the natural, it's not easy. But I'm determined in the name of Jesus to recover 100%. Amen. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. He goes on to say he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, and he asked alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. Now, this is implying that he's about to exercise his authority. Right. Look on us. He said, now, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. I don't make a religion out of silver and gold have I none. Amen. He didn't say, I've never had any. I'll never have any. He just happened to not have any that day. Right. Yeah. Every once in a while, I have uh, no silver and gold on me. Yeah. I got plastic, hallelujah. <laughs> now, Peter didn't have an account with Chase Bank. <laughs> didn't have a credit card. But don't make some religion out of it. The disciples were poor. Silver and gold had he none. <laughs> not at the moment. Yeah. And that's what the guy was asking for, arms. Right. But he got legs. <laughs> so he didn't have any on him at the time. Neither one of them did. But they didn't say, we don't have anything. We can't help you. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. What was it he had? Authority, dominion, royal authority, sovereign power. Hallelujah. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Notice that was the authority that Peter had. That was the authority that John had. That was the authority that the disciples had. That's the same authority that you and I have, praise God. Can you say amen? amen. I was uh, uh, in a restaurant, in a steak and ale restaurant years ago. 
And I had been to Indianapolis to the Indy 500. And after the race, uh, my host were taking me to a restaurant, steak and ale restaurant, to have dinner. Then I was going to fly home. And we're sitting in that restaurant. You know, my guy won the race that day. I was happy. You know, we're talking about things that happened during the race and so forth. And, and you know, not really at that point doing anything spiritual. We're just eating our meal. We're just talking about the race and so forth. And they were asking me, are you coming again next year and, and, and all that. And all of a sudden, this couple walked past our table and the man just fell right in the floor into a hard seizure. And he's just shaking violently. And I, I looked up at Walt and Pam and I said, the devil's crazy. <laughs> I learned that from Norval Hayes. The devil's crazy, I tell you. That's what Norval used to say. I don't know how many times that's happened to me. People fall in my presence in a hard seizure. And the devil ought to know by now what I'm going to do. I've done it on airplanes. I've done it in restaurants. And this guy fell in the floor in a hard seizure shaking violently. And so I got up and I knelt over him and I did exactly what Peter did. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whose I am and whom I serve, I command you devil to loose this man and to let him go. Come out of him. And he shook one more time and looked at me and said, what would you do? I said, I took authority over that devil that's tormenting you. I helped him up. He and his wife thanked me, and they walked out, and you ought to have seen everybody in there. Yes, <laughs> Nobody walked by my table anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I had it happen in the streets downtown Omaha, Nebraska, when I was still working with Brother Copeland. Between meetings, between services, he preached at 10, uh, 2, and 7.30 every night. And between services, I'd go out in the streets and witness all day. And I'm downtown after a morning service, Omaha, Nebraska, and, and I'm out witnessing and praying for people, and I'm on my way back to the hotel. And just as I started back to, I could see the hotel just about a block away. And I heard cars coming to a a sudden stop, brakes, you know, squealing and, and, uh, and people getting out of their cars and I don't know what's happened. I can't see what happened. So I gather, I walk up there and I, and I kind of look over the crowd, people are out looking and there was a guy, had a hard seizure laying in the middle of the street. Cars had to slam on their brakes to keep from hitting him. And he's laying in the middle of the street and he's shaking violently and everybody's just looking. And I looked around and I noticed some of the people in that crowd just looking were people that were coming to that meeting. Had Bibles under their arms. They'd been out for lunch. They was going back to the service. And so the Lord said, what are you going to do? And so I just kind of uh, asked people to, to spread out a little bit, let me come through. And so I got down on, the, on my knees, laying there next to him, or stand on my knees next to him, I did what Peter did. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whose I am and whom I serve, you devil, you come out of him. Loose him. Let him go in Jesus' name. What did I do? I'm exercising my authority and God's supplying the ability. I didn't heal the man. I didn't get the man. I didn't deliver the man. I exercised my authority. God did the delivering. God did the healing. Hallelujah. Amen. And he shook one more time, raised his head up and said, what'd you do? I said, I cast that devil out of you. He said, what was that name you said? I said, Jesus. He said, Jesus. I said, Jesus. And he's laying on his back in the street. And so I thought, well, I got him in this position. He can't get up. I might as well lead him to the Lord. So I led him to the Lord. And when I got through praying with him and had him to confess Jesus as Lord, I helped him up. Now, by this time, somebody had called an ambulance. I could hear it coming. 
And these guys got out and they come over there with their stretcher and they're expecting to see somebody laying in the street. He's standing up right next to me. They said, where's the man who had the seizure? I said, right here. He said, no, where's the man who fell in the street? I said, right here. We don't need you now. And the man just looking at me and he, he couldn't say anything but Jesus, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. They said, well, we're going to take him in for observation anyway. So they put him on this gurney, you know, and they put him up in the ambulance. And I'm standing there watching him, and I saw him raise up and put his face across in the window in the back of that ambulance. And I, I couldn't hear him, but I could read his lips. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. He got set free. I'm not the healer. I'm not the deliverer. I'm the one with the authority. Jesus gave it to me. And if I release my authority, he releases his ability, praise God. Jesus gets all the credit. Can you say amen? He's the one that delivered him. But notice that man could have stayed in the street, laying there shaking violently with all these believers standing around. And I overheard some of them saying, I wish there was something we could do. That's the worst thing a believer can say. We have the ability to release our God-given authority. There is something we can do, praise God. And if we release our God-given authority, God promises that He will release His ability. Can you say amen? amen? Paul is preaching in Acts chapter 14. And there was a man who was crippled. And Paul said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. What's he doing? Exercising his authority. Stand up on your feet. And he leaped and he walked. Paul released his authority and God released his ability. Can you say amen? amen. That's how you reign in life. That's how you rule and reign in life. Don't sit back and allow the devil to continue to steal from you, continue to torment you, torment your children. We have authority. I said, we have authority. Just like Peter released his authority, just like Paul released his authority, God came through and released his ability. This is how we reign in life. If you never release or exercise your God-given authority, then it's not likely that you will ever reign in life. The old religious idea, we're just waiting on God, doesn't apply here. Amen. We're just waiting on God. No, He's waiting on us. He's waiting on us. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Who's doing the resisting? We are. Who's backing it? God is. Amen? We're not just waiting on God. He's waiting on us to exercise and release our authority. And when we do, then He will back it with His ability, praise God. I'll say it again. We have sovereign power. We have royal authority. And we're supposed to be reigning in life. If anybody agrees, shout amen. Amen. Now, Romans 5, 17 from the Phillips translation says that we should live all our lives as kings. Not just occasionally, not just every once in a while, not just after we get inspired after hearing Brother Jerry preach <laughs> or Brother Justin preach. All our lives. Say, I'm to reign as a king all my life. Wouldn't you agree that kings live good lives? They live good lives. They live prosperous lives. Amen. It's like that Roman soldier, that centurion that said to Jesus one time, I tell a man do this and he does it. I tell a man to come, he comes. That's, that's authority. And, and, and he recognized the authority in Jesus' words. He wanted, he wanted him to come and, and uh, you know, uh, he had a, a, a servant that was sick. 
And Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. The man said, you don't have to come. I recognize authority. I'm a man under authority. I recognize authority. I have authoritative words. You have authoritative words. And if you'll just speak them, my servant shall be healed. Amen. That's the way kings are. They have authority in their words. They say something, it's done. Amen. They give a a decree and it's followed. Amen. Amen. So, the Philip says, we should live all our lives as kings. Once again, not occasionally, not every once in a while. Kings live good lives. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Amplified Bible says this. For we are God's own handiwork, yeah. His workmanship, recreated in Christ, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which He prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, listen to this, living the good life which He prearranged and made ready for us to live. Notice, He's already prearranged, put that back up there, the good life. Amen. He's already prearranged the good life. And it's ours for the receiving. That sounds like reigning. Amen. Reigning as kings, living the good life, which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. You know, you, you don't ever tap into that good life that he's prearranged and made ready for you until you have revelation of it. Yes. And you know, revelation has a way of creating a revolution. Yes, amen. You get a revelation of who you are in Christ, you will start a revolution in your house. You get a revelation of what you can do in Christ, you'll start a revolution in your house. You get a revelation of what you can have, and you will start a revolution in your house. I started that revolution 48 years ago, praise God. Amen. And it's still working, by the way. Hallelujah. I like ruling and reigning over Satan and all of his cohorts. Say this with me. Living the good life, the good life which, God has which God has prearranged and made ready, and made ready for, me for me is my destiny. Is my destiny. Say it again. Living the good life, the good life which, God has which God has prearranged and made ready for me, ready for me is, my is my destiny. Give the Lord a good praise for it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen to this. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, the Amplified Version, What eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and has not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prearranged, made, and keeps ready for those who love Him. My eyes have not seen yet. My ears have not heard yet. My heart has not conceived yet all the things that God has prepared for me. Hallelujah. That sounds like a good life, doesn't it? The good life, praise God. You know, uh, I learned a long time ago to not say this phrase anymore. It doesn't get any better than this. Yes, it does. I, I learned it on a motorcycle tour. Remember that, Bill, uh, George? We're riding along in Colorado. Man, I'm telling you, it's a beautiful ride. Colorado was made for bikers. <laughs> and we're riding through Colorado, and I'm telling you, it's just, it's just around every curve, it gets more and more beautiful. And we're riding around there. We got about, what, 60 bikers with us or something. We're riding around there. And Bill Horn, our director for Chariots of Light, he pulled up beside me. He said, Brother Jerry, it don't get any better than this. And I said, yeah, that's right. And, and then I pulled ahead of him a little bit. And the Lord said, don't you ever say that again. I backed up. I said, Bill, it gets a whole lot better than this. Yeah. 
This is just the beginning. Come on. This is day one on the tour. What do you suppose we got to look forward to the rest of the week? Amen. As good as your life might be right now, it gets better than that. I said it gets better than that. And when you think you have reached the, 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 the top, it gets better than that. Hallelujah. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? You know, Carol and I would have never dreamed when we first started out that we'd be living the kind of life we live today. And we give all the, all the glory to God. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be able to share this testimony with you. But we're living a good life. A good life. Praise God. A good life. Amen. And, and, and I learned about it through the word of God by revelation and then became a doer of it. And it didn't all happen overnight. No, I, I, we didn't start living the good life outwardly the first time I read this. Amen. We, didn't, we had hardly anything at the time I read this. I was out hunting Coke bottles to, to, to trade in to buy milk for my babies when I first read this. But I hadn't had to do that in a long, long time. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on. Amen. Living the good life. Amen. And God's no respecter of persons. Amen. You're supposed to reign as a king just as much as I am. Isn't that right? Aren't you one of the righteous? Say, I'm one of the righteous. So I have the opportunity to reign as a king. But you're not going to live that way if you keep feeling sorry for yourself and keep uh, blaming everybody else and, and keep on saying, nothing ever works for me. And, you know, that's good for Brother Jerry, but, you know, who am I? Like somebody said to me one time, well, how's that going to work for that little mechanic? I said, hey, I was that little mechanic. And it worked for me, praise God. I was a nobody. Hardly anybody knew I existed, but mom and daddy and Carolyn and her mom and daddy and my sister and her sister and a few relatives. That's it. How's it going to work for me? But I discovered it. I held fast to it. I kept pressing for it. And zowie, it happened, praise God. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Don't make excuses. Just get on with the program. He has prearranged and made ready for you to live the good life. I like to say it this way. We have yet to tap into all the things that God has prepared for us. It's ready and it's waiting for us to possess it. Proverbs 13, 22. The wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. The wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. That's one of those things he's prepared and made ready. Keeps and makes ready for us. I discovered that scripture many years ago. In fact, before I ever moved here, before I ever went to work with Brother Copeland, I discovered that scripture years ago. And I'd been witnessing to a man that I had, I had met, I was actually in the National Guard with, and uh, uh, we, were, we were going on a uh, tour, and we're riding in the back of a deuce and a half truck going to Fort Polk, Louisiana. And he's asking me about my testimony. He knew I'd come to the Lord and I was preparing for full-time ministry. And he's talking to me about, you know, this, that, and the other. And he says, well, how do you live? I said, by faith. He said, but you mean you trust God? Yes. <laughs> but, but how do you pay for things? I said, well, I believe God. Amen. Well, how does it come? I said, well, sometimes he'll send somebody, even though I'd shut my shop down, my business down, he'll send somebody and they just want me to work on their car. I don't have my shop anymore, but I can do it in my carport and I'll work on their car and they'll pay me and we pay our bills. And sometimes uh, my father-in-law calls on me and asks me to come out and 
help him on a job. He was a builder. I didn't know one thing about building houses, but I'd go help him and, and he'd bless me. And sometimes, you know, uh, it would come in the mail. Sometimes somebody would just come up and say, the Lord told me to give you this. You know, I'm trusting God. I don't know how he's going to do it. Amen. Carolyn told me one time she was reading the paper or either watching the news and, and it was a story about an old dog that came up to a, a policeman with a bag in his mouth. And the policeman took the bag out of his mouth and it had a bunch of money in it. And I just hollered, he's, he's asking for directions. He's hunting my house. <laughs> well, wait a minute. If the birds can sustain the prophet, if the fish got Amen. gold and brought to Peter, yes. how about an old dog? Yeah. Carolyn told me one time, Jerry, get out there and stop our dog from digging in my flower bed. I said, leave him alone. He may dig up some of them hidden riches. <laughs> You're a nut. Well, I'm a nut. That's living the good life. <laughs> That's reigning in life. And, and this man, you know, he, he was putting me off. He, was, he, he, he didn't want to hear it. And so, you know, I'm not pushing it on anybody. But one day I get a call. And he, his secretary says, can you come to Bob's office? And so I asked her where his office was. It's downtown Shreveport. I went to his office. He, he was, his family was a wealthy family. They owned several businesses. And he asked me to come to his office. When I came to his office, he said, I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't believe anything you say. But here. And he just started taking money out of his pocket and just throwing it at me. He said, wait a minute, that's not enough. And he went in his office and he wrote out a check and he gave it to me. And his, his secretary's standing there with her eyes like this. I said, well, Bob, I know why you're doing this. I said, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, the wealth of the sinner has been laid up for the just. Uh, I'm the just, you're the sinner. You better get saved or I'm going to wind up with everything you got. He said, dear God, pray for me. I led him to the Lord and praise God. He has been a deacon in his church now for 48 years. Not only that, but I was driving through Shreveport about maybe three years ago, and I stopped at the uh, a Cracker Barrel on Interstate 20. I was on my way to Vicksburg, Mississippi, where I was born, and I pulled over to the Cracker Barrel and uh, uh, was having lunch, and somebody come and tapped me on the shoulder, and I looked up, and it was Bob. He said, you remember me? I said, Bob, I'll never forget you. He said, I just want you to know, I'm still trusting God. I'm still serving the Lord. You changed my life 48 years, well, 40 years ago. Amen. Amen. And God has richly blessed him. Amen. Richly blessed him. Praise God. So the wealth of the sinner has been laid up for the just. Years ago, I was, uh, I'd, I'd have to drive by Miller's Brewery every time I'd go to my office out there on I-35. And one day, I just decided, rolled my window down, and I just shouted when I passed it. The wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. Rolled my window up and drove to the office. When I got ready to come home that day, I rolled the window down. The wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. I rolled my window up and uh, went on home. Not too long after that, Joe was our general manager back then, and Joe said, uh, we got a check from Miller's Brewery today. <laughs> At first I thought it was maybe somebody that worked there, got their paycheck, endorsed it, and sent it to us. No, it was a check from Miller's Brewery to Jerry Savelle Evangelistic Association. <laughs> and it was a good check. <laughs> now I told that story to a group of preachers where I was doing a, a minister's seminar, and they said, you didn't keep that filthy lucre, did you? I said, oh yeah, I prayed over it, praise God. I bind them devils off of it and I preach the gospel with it and I believe more's on its way, hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. The wealth of the sinner. Now listen to this. The Amplified says, and it finds its way eventually into the hands of the righteous for whom it was laid up. Do you think that this might be part of that 1 Corinthians 2.9? Yes. 
Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither is entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared, laid up for those who love Him. It says, and eventually it'll find its way into the hands of the righteous for whom it was laid up. Amen. God's got the heathen out working for us. I wish you'd get a little more excited about this. I, I, I am not reading First Jerry. I'm reading Proverbs 13. Start confessing it and start possessing it. Say, I confess it and I will possess it. Say it again. I confess it and I will possess it. It's part of my inheritance. Of my inheritance. Now, Psalm 3, 8 says, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord, and thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. That means stop and think about this. The blessing is upon God's people. Are you one of his people? Yes. Then the empowerment to prosper, the empowerment to excel, the empowerment to rise above what keeps everybody else down is on your life. Hallelujah. Amen. That sounds like the good life. Proverbs 10, The blessing of the Lord maketh rich. The New International says, and will even bring wealth. The blessing has the potential of making you rich, making you wealthy. Are you one of his people? So I'm one of his people. That blessing's on me right now. Amen. It's on you, praise God. It's on you. That sounds like reigning in life. Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. The New International Version says, we'll be richly blessed. Amen. A faithful man will be richly blessed. What are faithful people? People that are not hearers of the word only. They're doers of the word. Job 36, 11 says, If they obey and serve him, they will spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. The New Living Translation says, If they listen and obey, they will be blessed with prosperity throughout their lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Throughout your life. Hallelujah. Amen. If you're faithful, you will be blessed with prosperity throughout your life. Sounds like the good life to me. Can you say amen? amen? If you aren't enjoying this, then there's only two reasons, biblical reasons, why not? For additional messages by Jerry Seville. <laughs> Only two biblical reasons why you're not enjoying it. Number one, Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you're not enjoying this, then it's because you don't have knowledge of it. Well, you don't have that excuse anymore. I said, you don't have that excuse anymore. Then the only other scriptural reason why you're not enjoying this, James 1, 22. But be ye doers the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Either you don't know it or you're not doing it. Yes. That's the only two biblical reasons why you don't enjoy the good life which he has prearranged. That's the only reason why or the two reasons why you're not reigning in life as the Bible declares. Either you don't know anything about it, but that's not your excuse. You know about it. Or you're not doing it. You're not exercising what you've learned. God has made it possible for every person in this room, everybody that's watching this broadcast, to reign in life. But it's our responsibility to believe it, to receive it, and to enforce it. Can you say amen? Now, all of this sounds like to me flourishing. The faithful shall flourish. Ruling, reigning, good life, 
Sounds like to me flourishing. Yeah. God's got in his heart. God's got on his mind for you and I to flourish. Can you say amen? amen? That's our word from the Lord this year. Don't let it pass you by. Lay hold upon it in the name of Jesus and tell the devil there's absolutely no way you can stop it from happening. Praise God. Give the Lord a shout if you receive it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm doing everything I possibly can to help you get there. I preach sermons about it. Week after week when I'm here, I preach sermons about it. When I'm not here, I preach it all over the world. People are hearing me preach on flourishing all over the world. Amen. Amen. Writing books about it, the faithful shall flourish. Brand new, hot off the press, praise God. We sold out of these the first day at the convention. Had to go restock. Hallelujah. This is what I've been teaching here. The faithful shall flourish. Flourish. Praise God. Who'd like this book? Uh oh. <laughs> Amen. And here's another great book The Power of the Blood. We've been trying to get Carolyn to write this for a long, long time. This was one of the subjects she taught in the Bible school. It was, it was one of the most favorite subjects for, of our students. Every time she would teach it, praise God, the power of the blood. Oh, that hand went up before everybody else's did. There you go. Hallelujah. Amen. These resources are for your benefit. I don't need to write them for my benefit. I know this. I write them for your benefit. We preach them for your benefit. I don't preach anything that's not working for me already before I preach it. Hallelujah. So take advantage of the resources. Get it in your home. Get it in your heart. Hallelujah. And determine from this day forward, no devil is going to keep me from reigning. No devil is going to keep me from ruling. No devil is going to keep me from flourishing. I'm the one with royal authority. I'm the one with sovereign power. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Amen. Give the Lord your best shout. Praise God. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Go ahead and stand if you will. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Could the praise and worship team come back for a moment? Hallelujah. I want you to just lift your hands and begin to worship the Lord and thank Him for what you've learned today. For some of you, it's just been a refresher course. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I know there's other things we need to do here, but I, I would miss the Lord if I just if I just let you go and not, not do this. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I sensed in my spirit by the things that I said earlier that the Lord wanted me to agree with you, assist you in taking authority over some habits that have kept you bound. I'm not going to voice them. But you know what they are. Some, some of you are tormented by them. Some of you, you're, you're, you're not living the freedom in the freedom that Jesus bought and paid for. So I want you to come. you got habits And particularly long-standing habits. Come on up here right now. Let's take authority over it. In the name of Jesus. Let's, let's get everybody in here in agreement. They don't have to know what it is. That's not important. You know what it is. God knows what it is. And you have authority over it. And where any two of us shall agree, it's touching anything we ask, it shall be done. Say, it shall be done. done. So are you expecting it to be done today? Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Everybody in here, you stretch your hands out toward them. Let's believe God with them. If it was you, you'd want somebody in agreement for you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. 
in the name of Jesus. Lord, as a servant of the Most High God, I take dominion and authority. I release the sovereign power that you have granted me with as a believer. I join my faith with theirs. They came up this morning indicating they want to be free once and for all. Not for a season, not for a while, but once and for all. I have the authority and they have the authority to do this. You have the ability to make it happen. So as we release our authority, we're counting on you, Lord, to release your ability in the name of Jesus. Everybody just begin to pray in the Spirit. Thank you, Father. I take authority over this in the name of Jesus. I take authority over this in the name of Jesus. You begin to praise Him. I take authority over this in the name of Jesus. Now I'm expecting your freedom. You expect your freedom. I take authority over this in the name of Jesus. Satan, you bow. You have no right. You have no power. In Jesus' name, I take authority over this. In the name of Jesus, it's broken. No longer able to torment you, bind you, render you helpless that will not be a part of your life anymore. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. I take authority over this and I join my faith with His. For freedom, Jesus, mighty name. All that is not of the Holy Spirit, bow, depart, leave now. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift our hands and let's continue to worship Him. Jesus' name. I take authority over this. I take authority over this. In the name of Jesus. Free. Stand fast in that way.
Proverbs 37, verse 9, uses the word evildoers here, but just look at the enemy. I'm going to use the word enemy. For the enemy shall be cut off. But those who wait for, look for the Lord, shall inherit the earth. Now listen to this. Listen to the Old Testament. It says, for yet a little while and the evildoers, we'll say the enemy, for yet a little while and the enemy will be no more. Say that with me. The enemy will be no more. Then it says this, though you look with care where the enemy used to be, the enemy will not be found. Let, let me say that again. Verse, verse 9 says, For the enemy shall be cut off, but those that wait and look for the Lord shall inherit the earth. So we need to get our mind off the enemy. Get your mind off on how bad you are. Get your mind off on how, how much you failed and how much you've disappointed God and how much, how much you've done wrong. Get your mind off your past, your failures and everything and get your mind on God because it's those that wait for and those that trust in the Lord because it says, for yet a little while the enemy will be no more. Though you look with care where the enemy used to be, he will not be found. I declare the enemy is under our feet this morning because we have authority. Say, I have authority because I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's who I am. I am powerful. I am mighty. I am anointed. I am blessed. And I am free in every area of my life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sean. 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 Come up here for a minute. Hallelujah. If I could have some guys come up and surround Sean. Sean's brother went home to be with Jesus this week. I know he needs some, some strength around him and some peace around him. Hallelujah. But one thing I wanted, uh, that I need to do as a pastor and authority is I take authority over the spirit of grief. Now, I didn't say, we, the Bible says we don't mourn like those that have no hope. It doesn't say we don't mourn. It just says we don't mourn like those that have no hope. So I take authority over the spirit of grief. And I command the peace of God to flow over you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. I declare the anointing is going to walk through, walk you through this. I declare it right now. Just receive it. That, the anointing is all over you. The anointing is all over you. Just receive. Just lift your hands to him, to heaven, Sean. And stop taking the blame that you could have done something more. Stop taking the blame. Yeah, the enemy is trying. Yeah, the enemy has even plagued you that maybe if you were a little more holy, you could have got him healed. Maybe if you were a little more powerful, a little more close to Jesus, you could have done something different about it. I take authority over the enemy that would put you in a place of shame, in a place of defeat in Jesus' name. And I declare freedom over you in Jesus' name. I declare the enemy is cut off. And I declare a new day. A new day has dawned. The day spring on high has visited us. Freedom. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The enemy is under our feet. I just heard this phrase come up on the inside of my heart. Look up and live. Look up and live. Lick up, lick up, look up and live. Hallelujah. See, what is it? looking down represents failure. It represents defeat. It represents, you know, a lot of times, you know, you can tell when people have defeat on them, they'll walk into a room and just their head's down. Maybe nothing wrong, but, but sometimes the enemy would just plague us. That we just, we walk into a room and don't allow the enemy to defeat you any longer. 
because you are, you are just what you ought to be. You are righteous. Hallelujah. It's not in a prideful way. When you walk into a room, you own the room. Why? Because God's on the inside of you. You carry God in there with you. When you go to work, you carry God there with you. When, when, you, when, you're, when you're in your house, don't allow your children or your, the enemy to make you feel defeated or in fear. No, you have authority in your home. You have authority everywhere you go. Because God's on the inside of you. God's on the inside of you. And he is defeated and the enemy is cut off. And it says that it says the meek shall inherit the earth. What is a good definition for meek? A lot of times people say, well, it's just those that they're quiet. No, you know what the, the greatest definition I ever heard of the word meek is? Perfect power in perfect control. The meek, shall, those that are in perfect power and perfect control walk in the fullness of what God called them to. And that's who you and I are. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm the meek. And I, I inherit the earth. Look to your other side and say, I have perfect power and I'm in perfect control and I inherit the earth. Give him a shout of praise. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. God is good. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated for a moment. We have a few things. Just bear with us with, I know it's uh, close, close to 12, but I have a few things we need to do today. You always want to obe be obedient to what the Holy Spirit wants to do, right? Hallelujah. It's not hurry up and get church done. It's, it's let's make sure we're, God has his way. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to receive this morning tithes and offerings. And while you're preparing to do that, Galatians chapter 6 tells us not to be weary in well-doing, right? Amen. Let me go there real quick. Ephesians 6 says, Be not deceived, God is mocked, not mocked, for whatsoever a man sows... That shall he also reap. For he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. You can say this. For he is that just sows natural things shall, can only reap natural things. But he that sows to the spirit shall reap spiritual things that are everlasting, meaning they don't have an end. Verse 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. A lot of times as it pertains to our giving, it can, it, we, we can allow the enemy to get us into a place of being weary. The word weary means coming to a place where you feel like you failed in your heart. It's, it's, the, the fail, the, it's when your heart fails, so to speak. You ever heard that statement? Well, no, his heart just failed, meaning, meaning he gave up just because he lost his passion. And so really the scripture is, don't be deceived, God is not mocked. So it says, do not be weary in well-doing. Meaning, meaning, see, a lot of times we, we'll start strong, but do we finish strong? Yes. You know, a lot of times we start things, the things of God with passion, but do we allow our heart to fail in a matter? You know, as we look at this, when you, when you continue to give or you continue to sow, never let go of your patience when it comes to, to, comes to your giving. You know, in Luke chapter 8, it talks about the sower sows the, sows, sows the word. And he's talking about the principle of a seed. And he talks about if you sow on this type of soil, you'll have this type of harvest. If you sow in this type of soil, the enemy will come and eat it. If you sow in this type of seed, the, the, the birds of the air will come and they'll take it. If you sow on this type of seed, the thorns will come in and they'll choke the seed. But then it says when you sow on good ground, it says you'll reap a harvest, Right? So, but, but in Luke's version of this, in Luke chapter 8, it says that you bring forth fruit with patience. See, there, there, it's more than just I'm throwing seed. It's more than just planting seed into good ground. We also have to allow and we have to release the spiritual force of patience. Meaning I'm, I'm not going to grow weary in well-doing. Because he's saying what I'm sowing is a good thing. When I sow it's a good thing. What I need to make sure I'm doing is make sure I'm not getting weary. Yeah. And allow patience to have its perfect work in my life. Because James says when patience have its perfect work in my life, I'll be perfect. I'll be tired, entire and wanting nothing. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it talks about add to your faith virtue and your virtue temperance and your temperance patience right 
Because it says if you do these things and these things be in you, you'll not be barren or unfruitful. So it's not just having faith in my giving, but am I adding patience to what I'm doing? Am I adding love to what I'm doing? Am I allowing knowledge? Am I allowing diligence? So it's acquired. It's not just having faith, but am I allowing my faith to, am I allowing patience to have its perfect work? Amen? In my life. So as you're sowing this morning, don't get weary. Yeah. Amen. Because God's word is true. Don't, don't look at giving as, oh, I'm just sowing to that church just to, to, to meet their need. No, if that's your attitude, don't give, please. Amen. Don't give, please. Because we understand here at Heritage the principles of seed time and harvest. But we also know that farmer, it's not just, you know, it, it, you know Sarah grew, grew up on the farm, and it's not just, it's not just sowing a seed. And then, and then pulling up the next day. No, that farmer has to have some patience because he knows there's a lifespan in that seed, right? Because right. he knows eventually there's going to be a harvest. Right. And I want to I wanna declare to you, as you continue to give, harvest is coming. Promotion is coming. Peace is coming. Wisdom is coming. Overflow is coming. Amen. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to give this morning. And we just thank you for your faithfulness over, over your word, that you watch over your word to perform it. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, you can receive the offering. And while they're doing that, show this video. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Heritage of Faith. Whether it's your first time or you're a regular, we're so glad that you're here today. Every week, our expectancy levels rise for what God has in store. He's constantly doing something new, and we believe that today He will meet you right where you're at. So open up your heart, raise your expectancy, and get ready for your miracle. Ladies, what were some of your favorite memories growing up as a little girl? Was it dressing up like a princess, or learning how to bake yummy snacks, or my personal favorite, pajama, pajama, pajama. Pajama parties! Well, that's exactly what we're doing this month. So join us for our first ever Girlfriends Pajama Party. Come in your PJs, bring your favorite pillow and blanket, and spend an evening resting in the presence of the Father. Bring a snack that starts with the letter P, Pastor Nett's favorite letter. Invite a friend, and we'll see you there. Pajama, pajama, pajama. Are motorcycles your passion? Did you know that God can take something that you are passionate about and turn it into a massive ministry opportunity resulting in 50,000 salvations and counting in just a few years? That is the actual story of Chariots of Life. When you join us this Tuesday for our monthly meet, you will discover an international outreach with thousands of members all enjoying life and sharing Jesus across the world. Acts 2.17 says that in the last days, God would pour out his flesh, his flesh on all spirit. <laughs> Are you in grades six through 12 and desire to take your place in this end time generation? That time is now. <laughs> yes. Come to G29 with yummy snacks, super awesome games, anointed worship, and always a powerful word from God we will be that generation to fulfill all that God has called us to, and we're gonna have a whole lot of fun doing it. <laughs> That's strange. We really enjoy giving at Heritage. We are always looking for an opportunity to be a blessing wherever we can. In July, our women's ministry will be collecting school supplies for the Cleburne Family Crisis Center. You can find a list of the supplies in the lobby. In July, our women's ministry will be collecting School supplies. Why? Wow, it's the easiest one, Emily. You can find a list of the school supplies needed and a drop box for any donations made in the lobby. Are you new to our Heritage family? We are so excited to have you with us today. See this card? You can find it in the seat back in front of you. Simply fill out the information on the bottom, tear it off, and turn it into our first time visitors lounge on your way out to pick up your special welcome gift. Thank you so much for joining us today, and welcome to the family. I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm minister.
pastor to the next generation of the church. The next pastors, our future worship leaders, teachers, and missionaries. I minister to the next generation of world leaders. The next politicians, police officers, and lawmakers. The next generation of mothers and fathers. Your future doctors. Your grandchildren's teachers. Your future actors and songwriters. I minister to children. My calling is sure. My vision is clear. My desire is strong. My impact is vital. My mission is paramount. My faith is aimed for breakthrough. My purpose is set on Christ. And my heart is filled with joy. In a world of doubt, I offer hope. In a world of confusion, I offer truth. In a world of division, I offer unity. In a world of hate and fear, I offer faith and love. I minister to your children and grandchildren. This is who I am, and this is what I do. Together, we are strong. Together, we are excellent. Together, we are passionate. About what we do and who we serve. We are Heritage Kids. We are Heritage Kids. We are Heritage Kids. Heritage Kids. Heritage Kids. We are Heritage Kids. Man, did you want to say anything? Okay. Well, today, uh, today is Promotion Sunday. Believe it or not, actually, we have some kids that actually start school tomorrow. Um, and, and so... <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, uh, yeah, that it's some, some, sometimes it seems like they're starting earlier and earlier. And so over the next three weeks, um, we have, we have different, different schools that are starting at different times. And so this is our promotion Sunday. And so we have their kids. Uh, they're, are you excited to go to your new classes and everything? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Amen. And so, and so some, you know, they, the preteens are like, yeah, kind of, whatever. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so, um, but anyway, no, you know, we're also just starting this Sunday, actually, um, our youth will be from 6 to 12. They'll still be able to come on Sunday mornings to Spark 252, but, um, but also we're adding to where 6th grade can be a part of our youth services on um, Sunday evening and uh, Wednesday night as well. So, so with that, you, ha- you received something in your, uh, on your chair today, and, and this is M&M prayers for back to school. How many people like M&Ms? I love M and M's, right? And so, and so, each one when you eat, like a blue one, you can do. You can pray specifically for the children, you know, that are closest to your home. And we'll go through these in a minute as we pray over kids. But I want Tanya to share. So we were. Ooh, hello. Uh, as we, as a, as a department, think about our church and think about uh, all of the great things we get to do with your kids, we get to minister to your kids. One of the ways we wanted to activate our body is to do something creative with prayer. You may not be called to serve and minister on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night to these kids, but y'all are called to pray and believe God with us. So with the with the blue NMM, you're gonna pray for the kids that are specific to you that you know that are in your circle, the schools that are in your community. Um, You have authority over that territory, and we want to take it in the name of Jesus. The second one is for parents, and any parents with any school-aged kids, it's a big deal to send your kids to school. Um, You pray over that school. You pray over the parents that they hear for the right place to send their kids. Um, And there's a lot of parents that school at home, so pray over them because they need the anointing to flow as they minister to their kids in their house. Now, brown is for the teachers, and we want our teachers in all of our schools to have the anointing of God, especially those Christian teachers that are placed by God into those schools. We want them to have the Spirit of the Lord with them, to be lights in that dark place. If it is a dark place, it may not be, but we want to make sure that we're covering those teachers, that they're anointed to minister to those kids. Yellow is for the school bus safety. Um, We want to pray protection, pray Psalms 91 over our kids as they travel to and from school. Um, Parents of teenagers will covet your prayers as their teenagers drive themselves to and from school. We want those angels declared over them. Um, We want you to pray for our department, for our Heritage Kids team. We have a great group of anointed teachers. Um, We don't play church. There's no junior Holy Spirit. What happens in here as far as anointing is happening in all of these areas. So believe God for our incredible team to continue to minister to your children. This is an exciting time when we get to promote them to the next age. So these kids right here are looking forward to being in the youth building and being part of Spark. We want our Spark team ready to receive them. Amen. 
and red is for uh, administrators, any employees of the school, the principals. We know that in this generation, we need to stand in prayer behind them and supporting our Christian administrators, the teachers, down to the janitors, the cafeteria staff. If they're born again believer, they're put there by God to be in those places, to minister to those kids, even if it's just a smile. So as a body of Christ, we get to be part of what's going on with our kids in this generation. So we're believing for revival. We're believing that the Holy Spirit pours out on them and that we're going to have a fantastic school year. Amen? Yeah. And for all they invest into our young people. And if you serve in, in, in our, our children's departments, any of our children's departments, whether it's zero up through youth, stand to your feet. Amen. Stand, stay standing. And let's... let's uh, Stretch your hands towards all our children and our, and, our, and our leaders and our volunteers. Father, we just thank you for your hand upon our children as they begin a new school year. Lord, I thank you this new school year. It's a new season. And I thank you, Father, for your hand being upon them as they step into this new season. We thank you for your hand of protection, your hand of peace. I thank you that every single one of them has the exact teacher that they need to have. I thank you that our children and young people are always in the right place at the right time. I thank you, Father, that you have gifted all of our local teachers teachers and our local administrators, Father, with the grace to lead, the grace to direct, the grace to, to be what our children and young people need in, in this year, in this season, Father. I thank you for your hand upon all of our, our young people, volunteers, Father, in here, Lord, that, 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 that they would be anointed to hear on behalf of our young people in all of their classes, Father, to direct our, 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 our children's ministries the way they need to be directed. We thank you, Father, that, that we're rising higher and higher in our children's ministries. We thank you, Father, for your peace, your protection, and your power that is not only surrounding but within our young people as they go throughout 2017 and 2018. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do you have anything else? You good? Yeah. Exchange from... Uh, coming into Heritage Kids into G29, you parents may have some questions uh, just about how that's going to work. So if you, if you have a student that is going into our G29 department, we're going to have a short meeting to you where you can answer any questions that you want right over here in the overflow room right after service. Amen. Everyone okay. stand to your feet. Don't forget, ladies, tomorrow night, girlfriends, ministry, pajama party, tomorrow night at 7. And so wear your pajamas and bring a pea food, right? It's a food with starts with P, something like that. So anyway, she's going to continue, uh, and you, know, you don't want to miss it. She's been preparing for that. It's going to be an awesome time. Other than that, we love you guys. Have an all super awesome week, and we'll see you Wednesday night. God bless. Yeah. Mm. Yes.